I'm Jane Alexander, Nantucket Book Festival alumna, welcoming you to At Home with Authors. On this episode of At Home with Authors, not Joe Biden, come on, but maybe the next best thing, the New Yorker's Evan Osnos, author of a brand new book on the president-elect, Joe Biden, The Life, The Run, and What Matters Now. Evan is a Nantucket Book Festival alum, winner of the National Book Award for Age of Ambition, Chasing Fortune, Truth, and Faith in the New China. A few years ago, you had just written Age of Ambition, the result of 10 years of reporting in China. And I asked you, what do you think the reader will want to get? What do you think the reader can get out of your book, The Age of Ambition? And do you remember what your answer was? No, I don't actually. That's why we have the tape. (laughs) I think it will help people in the United States sleep better at night. And uh, in the sense that we will know more about this place that looks so forbidding to us from far away. My hope going into this conversation two weeks before Election Day was that based on his conversations with Joe Biden, and his ongoing deep dive into American political culture, Evan Osnos could again give us reasons to sleep better at night. So let me ask you your new new book on Joe Biden, the result in a sense of 10 years of reporting, just like China. Did mm-hmm. you always report your major works over 10 years? <laughs> now, this is different than my very much. It's different than my China book in a, I mean, in a, in a dramatic way, in the sense that this is really um, more of an extended essay, really. I mean, on, on the subject, as you, as you can tell from the book on, on my thoughts on this man and this moment. Um, He's not somebody, it's not like I've covered him the way I covered a country like China, where it's a kind of consuming all the time experience. This is, a person who has been a recurring fascination of mine going back to 2011. And I started interviewing him in person when I came to the US in 2013 and went to go see him. And honestly, Michael, the reason why I was initially drawn to Joe Biden was because of his involvement in foreign affairs. That's how I was approaching the United States. And that's what interested me. And he'd been interested in foreign affairs for decades and wanted to talk about it. And then there's another thing here, which is kind of funny to talk about, which is he was the vice president of the United States, which meant that to most of the political press corps in Washington, he couldn't have been less important, relevant, interesting. And I, found him quite sort of open and accessible. I mean, you just as a, he, he wasn't, you know, to quote, um, as, as you know, there's a wonderful tradition of vice presidents maligning their own office. I mean, going back to, um, you know, go back to the 19th century and there were vice presidents who turned down the job because they said they didn't want to be put into the grave any sooner than necessary. But Biden had a slightly different approach. He seemed almost kind of thrilled to be there. And he took the thing seriously. And for that reason, uh, I found him to be quite a rewarding interviewee um, for one more particular reason, which is that he, it's not that he doesn't spin, everybody spins in Washington. It's just that he's not especially good at it. And so he has a way of ending up to saying what he thinks, uh, despite the best efforts of himself and his advisors. And for that reason, I found him to be um, kind of persistently interesting and in drawing me back and back and back. So I'd go see him occasionally, but you know, this was in the midst of all the other work I was doing. And I just sort of watched him evolve over this period as an American institution, um, along with these other institutions I was writing about. First of all, for all the young writers, I'm going to turn around. I didn't expect to do this, but, you know, I always have like books around me. And so this is, I'm going to show you, you know, E.O. Wilson. Sure. So, you know, the great biologist, conservationist, letters to a young scientist. And one of the letters is all about, I haven't read this in a while, but it's all about, you know, go away from the crowd. 
if you're an emerging scientist, and this this could apply to journalists, you know, yeah. don't follow where the crowd is reporting. And this is exactly what you did with Joe Biden. The crowd was not pursuing him. He was not as relevant. And yet you found out he was and was soon to be extremely relevant. Um, yeah, that's a, it's funny. You know, I I very much sort of it's a it is a I, I don't want to dress it up. I've, I consider it a failing that, you know, I never really I mean, there's I guess there's two ways to put it. You know, there I when I moved to Washington, I found some of the byways of Washington journalism um, strange and somewhat bewildering. I mean, in, in the sense that, you know, I came from this country in which there was one ministry of propaganda, right? You sort of knew what they were trying to get across to you. You could sort of protect your intellectual flank by being aware of what they were trying to do. And I got to Washington and discovered that at a minimum, there were 435 ministries of propaganda just on Capitol Hill. And so the idea of trying to kind of navigate that took, uh, was gonna take some doing and I had to learn it. And I thought that in the meantime, if everybody was gonna be contesting that space, and sort of fighting it out journalistically and politically within the confines of that main event. There was so much else that you could cover if you just kind of wandered away a bit. And that's one of the things that led me to the vice president. Well, it's interesting because you said foreign policy was what drew you to him in many ways. And, you know, one of the things, I mean, I, I've learned it in bits and pieces, but it was so clearly stated in your book, you know, Biden as a key foreign policy advisor on three major issues. He had the opposite view of the Secretary of State at the time, Hillary Clinton. And how did how did you learn that? Was that all public information or how did that get crystallized for you? And why is it important today? Well, it's interesting that in, in some ways, you know, Biden was on the opposite side of some important moments. Take one, for example, would be the decision by the United States to intervene in Libya. And this was something that Hillary Clinton was in favor of. Obviously, the United States eventually went ahead with it. Biden was quite wary. He was worried about it. He said, and this reflects, I think, an underlying um, habit of mind of his as a foreign policy figure is that he takes a fairly conservative approach to the application of American power. I think some of this is the scar left by having supported the war in Iraq, which he now, of course, recognizes to be a catastrophic error. Um, but you know, in the 1990s, he was one of the people who favored the NATO bombing campaign in the Balkans. And that was in some ways actually a departure from his own pattern because he came to it warily, but then, but then emphatically, and looks back on it with, with some pride, actually, that he was one of the people who argued that that's a case in which America has the ability to protect civilians and we should do it. Uh, but actually, over the course of the Obama administration, he really was a voice for restraint. He was not in favor of the surge. He was not in favor of, he was wary of the bin Laden raid. Um, because he said, if it goes wrong, we, I mean, with his words at the time were, if it goes wrong, um, you'll be a one-term president, is what he said. But I think it's important to differentiate. It wasn't that he didn't think the United States should go after Osama bin Laden. It's that he thought that the specific alchemy of intelligence, opportunity, and the potential downside risk was too dangerous. And so it was a, a, a little bit of a window into his conservative instincts about when to use force and not. But I will say one other thing, Michael, you know, I've talked to Biden about this in quite in, in some detail, and I spoke to Obama about it. And I, I asked Obama, how did you how did you use Joe Biden in, or how did you regard Joe Biden in, in your foreign policy calculations? Because he obviously was not exactly where you were on some things. And he said, well, the truth is that sometimes that was very much by design. He said, I would have Biden go out and play a role in our negotiations specifically designed to try to generate debate. So I would have him, we would decide before our meeting, the two of us, 
that Biden, you're going to play the role of the dove in this meeting because I want to make some space and I want to air things out. Because if we're all coming at this armed and ready to go, then that forecloses the possibility of a substantive debate. And that surprised me. It was not something I had um, had appreciated before talking to both of them. You know, again, you are, how old are your kids? I'm going to bring this back to parenting because this is a really important lesson here. Given right. where we're at in the culture mm. and there, there is an issue out there with the inclination to moral certitude. You know, you there is one answer and there is one right answer. And if you're not on board and listening to your anecdote and other anecdotes, you know, this was a case where, you know, we've got to generate real debate where people are okay airing their divergent viewpoints. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Your, your kids are too young for that specific. How old are your kids now? <laughs> they are four and two. So I would say we, you know, we have not achieved the full heights of rhetorical eloquence yet in our house. Right. But but you're modeling, I'm sure, the, the importance of listening. Well, you know, but I, I do think you hit on a key point, both about the politics and about the culture, which is, and it's easy to forget this now, three and a half years after the end of the Obama administration, that there really was a culture inside that uh, decision making apparatus of, of airing your views and of a fierce contest of opinion. And, and it got it got tough. I mean, look, when Robert Gates, who, of course, was the uh, secretary of defense under under uh, Obama, um, came out and and criticized Biden and said he's been wrong on every major foreign policy question of our generation. Biden came back with his own guns blazing and said, hold on, Bob Gates, you were a Kremlinologist at the CIA who failed to see the end of the Soviet Union coming. And the reason I mention this is when I asked Leon Panetta about that debate, why did these two go so fiercely to each other? And he said, it's because they had over the course of the Obama administration, these really intense, very specific debates about how to use American power. And over time, Panetta said, it just wore down Bob Gates. He got kind of deleted by it. And, uh, but what I would say is that it's a credit, frankly, to, it's a credit to our system at the time that we were having those because to state the obvious, the current administration um, is not having the kind of robust, serious, well-informed debates about the use of intelligence and, and the role of American power. It's just not. And I, even its most generous defenders would agree with that. And I want to say for people who are looking for a great book, Joe Biden, you know, I I was not fully aware and that you have a whole segment on, on the Gates-Biden conflict and I was not fully aware of it. I knew there was some criticism and you, you laid it out so clearly and just what you said there, when I, I remember reading the Biden responses to Gates in your book and saying, you know, it's tough, but it's civil. Mm, yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. Yeah, these are, look, these were two professionals who were having a reasonable um, dispute and it's interesting, Michael, you mentioned civil because, you know, the word civil and civility has sort of become contested too, because it can be, we can think of it sometimes as a euphemism for suppressing, you know, robust debate in politics. And of course, that's not what you mean. And it's not what I mean. I mean, what I think of, and I happen to be writing on this right now, on a, a just a, a piece around the election that'll be in the New Yorker is about the nature of how we have this long running tradition in American politics of you know, what we might call the pen and the sword, the kind of the, the, the fierce exchange of ideas. And then of course, um, the sort of blunt force of, of violence to call it what it is, but it is the, you know, our commitment one hopes to that ability to be able to have a rational debate that is part of what makes us who we are. And I, I am very much hoping we have an, we haven't lost that. And I don't think we have, actually. What do you, you know, I want to stay with Biden just a little bit longer yeah. because as you got to know him over the years and foreign policy is what drew you there, but really your book opens with such an incredible anecdote. And I had never read a full account of his near-death experience in 1988. Is this the first time it's come out or where did you get that? It's a combination of my interviews with him and the family, uh, particularly his sister Val, um, and then it has been written about in bits and pieces here and there. And I, 
you know, this is for people who don't know it, the story of what happened in 1988 when he suffered two aneurysms that were so uh, that were so severe that at one point the doctors called in a priest to read last rites, um, to deliver last rites, even before his wife could be by the bedside. It was so grave, the situation. And Biden ended up spending seven months recovering before he could get back to Congress. And three months of that was flat on his back, couldn't even move his head. And eventually made a full recovery and kind of returned to public life. But the reason I mentioned that and why it seemed like kind of an important way to start this, this study of him um, is that it captured this pattern in his life, this extraordinary pattern in his life of, of just astonishingly cruel turns of fate. And we'll talk a bit about his, about his family and the loss of two of his sons and his, and his late wife. But at the same time that he's had these cruel twists of fate, he has also had these moments of astonishing uh, reversal and redemption and rehabilitation. And here he is now on the cusp of history. And, and, and buried in that biography was that moment. And it, I just thought in a very human way, it actually speaks to, um, to his life in a way that perhaps his political biography doesn't do as eloquently. A, I mean, it's a memorable story, and it's if it were a singular story in his life, but it's just it was you know again and again throughout this biography, there are these these incredible, incredible knockdown. Your life is over, basically. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's um, you know, I one of his oldest associates and you know, was his chief of staff, was a guy named Ted Kaufman, of course, ended up taking his seat in Delaware in the Senate after Biden went to the vice presidency. And this idea was crystallized for me by Ted Kaufman when I said, what, I, Ted Kaufman said to me at one point, look, um, Joe Biden is the luckiest man I know and the unluckiest man I know. And there is a powerful American element in that story because of the sheer sort of bandwidth of the fluctuations in his life. And I just found that to be a compelling framework. And that became for me, one of the ways that I sort of came to understand him. And it was honestly, he, Ted Calvin said that to me before Joe Biden was the nominee for president. And in a, in a way to understanding the way that his life has taken all these turns probably helped, was part of the reason, frankly, why I kind of sensed that this candidacy was gonna go better than it might've been assumed at the beginning. Um, boy, there's, there's so much there. You know, one of the reasons I'm always fascinated to talk to you is that, you know, for the audience too, you, you, your work is informed, even if it's not explicit in this piece, it's informed by such a wide range of experience as a journalist. And we talked about the 10 years of China. I would like to recommend, I don't know what you think, but for people reading this book, do it as a twofer, read this book, side by side with your piece in the New Yorker from May entitled How Greenwich Republicans Learn to Love Trump. Mm. And I just reread that piece this morning before the interview and I found it so fascinating to dive into these two aspects of American culture. As you, as you put those two pieces side by side, this biography of Biden and what you learned, which by the way, we learned some of your own biography in that piece, which I'd love you to share a little bit of, but mm -hmm. what, what got you thinking, you know what, I, I need to go back to my hometown of Greenwich, Connecticut and figure out how did this you know, bastion of the moderate Republican party swing to Trump? Tell us a little bit about that. And then what light does that shed on just what you've learned about Joe Biden and America's response to Joe Biden? Mm. In, in this past 10 years. Yeah, it's a really interesting connection, actually, that you drew there. I, I think um, very often I am coming to these subjects as a little bit, um, a little bit like, you know, the man from Mars, uh, because I moved back to this country after a decade abroad. And, 
this is my place. Look, I'm an American through and through, but I had so much that I had to begin to understand about what had happened. I think a lot of us feel as if, the, you know, there have been about three decades packed into the last decade and a half, just in terms of the sheer pace and velocity of American change in life. And I was trying to begin to make sense of that. And one of the things that was fascinating to me was, a. Uh, uh, frankly, something that shocked me, which is I grew up in a town called Greenwich, Connecticut, which after all was really the heartland of, of what we think of as country club Republicans, moderate Republicans, establishment Republicans. The, it's the literal hometown of the Bush family. I mean, this is, you know, George H.W. Bush grew up going to Greenwich Country Day School and and his father, Prescott Bush, was, uh, you know, a local political figure, eventually a senator from Connecticut, classic Rockefeller Republicans. And when Donald Trump came on the scene in 2016, initially Greenwich was very wary. I mean, there was a story in the local paper, a uh, kind of op-ed by one of the local organizers um, who said, you know, he is vulgar and not to our taste. And, and this is why I'm not going to be supporting him. And then Greenwich came around, Re Greenwich Republicans came around on Donald Trump and he ended up winning the primary there in town. And when I broke down the primary results by precinct, it wasn't just that he, he won sort of some of the working class neighborhoods that are similar to some of the areas around the country where he has been popular. Actually, he was most, he had his biggest wins in some of the wealthier neighborhoods in town. And I found that really interesting. I wanted to understand how the Republican Party that had been that, had, that I recognized in Greenwich, how it had become amenable and ultimately supportive of Donald Trump. And I should say my own family, you know, moved to Greenwich in the 1930s. My great grandfather was a Republican, very much in the tradition of those old Rockefeller Republicans. And to see the trajectory that it traveled over the course of of three or four generations begins to tell you a bit about how the Republican Party today um, finds itself the party of Trump. I mean, one of the things that I concluded was that actually we were describing Trump in the wrong way. We would often describe him as a hostile takeover of the Republican Party, but actually it, it was something closer to a joint venture because there were, and I spoke to a number of people in Greenwich from various phases of our kind of uh, the sort of history of Republican politics who, who said that in the end, they came to put most of their political rationale and decision-making on matters of tax policy, business regulation, and what they thought it would mean for the business environment. And that was a departure from the world of Prescott Bush, you know, the sort of father of George H.W. Bush, who used to talk about politics in terms very much about values, and he would use a kind of overtly moral language. And I found that in Greenwich today, that was not as welcome. It was kind of regarded as, a, as, some, as somehow sort of inappropriate for politics. And I, 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 I do describe this kind of mournfully. But I, the reason I think it also connects to Joe Biden is that in another period in American life, a candidate like Joe Biden, who is, after all, a, a centrist Democrat, you might even call him a conservative Democrat, you know, somebody who um, was, you know, a, a basically a, a believer in the idea that the center of the American electorate is, is not that far, is not that far apart uh, on the left or the right. That's somebody who Greenwich Republicans two or three generations ago might have find themselves preferring over a candidate like Donald Trump, who does such kind of overt violence to the values of what the Republican Party used to stand for, like, you know, free trade and a vigorous, uh, you know, foreign policy and uh, accommodating immigrants in the way that Prescott Bush uh, wanted. Um, and instead, there was a lot of opposition to Biden among Republicans in Greenwich. I will add one other thing, Michael, which is important, which is I think that when the votes are counted, there's not there's not a question in my mind that Biden will carry Greenwich because overall it is a place that is now mostly independents, followed by Republicans and then followed by Democrats. Um, and I think for by and large, the town looks at Donald Trump and says he's not he's not he's not who we are. But that doesn't it doesn't actually, um, but you still have to keep in your mind the fact that he was able to win in the primaries for the Republican Party. And that's a, a window into how the party has changed in a dramatic way. 
And so keeping Biden in your mind, you, you refer to a piece that you're working on now, which has to do in some ways with civil discussion, civil, as you, as you mentioned, not meaning, uh, you know, keeping the disagreements tapped down, but just basic civility. Uh, is anything, you, you said you're interviewing Richard Hofstadter, you can tell but, us. Uh, I mean, I've just been reading Hofstadter. I mean, um, alas, would have liked to interview him, but he's, he's oh. long gone. But you know, he's, he's, but it, I mean, but, the, uh, but to go to your point, actually, I might reframe one thing, Michael, just that you mentioned, just yes. if yeah. you're describing the piece, what I'm yeah. really looking at is sort of, uh, uh, and I, you know, I described it very roughly. So, but you know, in short, what I'm looking at is uh, American political culture. I mean, that's sort of beyond the personas at the top. I'm trying to understand what are the competing elements of American political culture. So I like that. What, what do you not understand about American political culture now that you hope to find out in this inquiry? And, the, and uh, then how does that relate back to just, just your core understanding of what you've learned about Joe Biden and what yeah. he represents? Yeah, it's, well, one of the things that I found, that I found interesting was if you go back to the very beginning of the American political experiment, what was the thing that was drawing the Europeans like Tocqueville over to the US to study what we were doing? What, why were they fascinated? You know, why did they come over here? And one of the reasons they came over here was because we were this oddity in the world. I mean, here we were a a vast country that was trying to implement a system of representative democracy, which was something that they talked about in Europe, but nobody really thought they could apply. Um, here we were taking essentially a political system designed for these little city states in the Mediterranean, and we were putting it on this huge scale. And what they found, people like Tocqueville found when they came to the US was that we had this we had this understanding of what we imagined to be rational political discourse, you know, that we could have mostly through the process of association, these kinds of organizations where we would come together and, you know, they marveled at the fact that if you put five Americans in a room, they would form two associations and one fraternal order. It was, we were constantly sort of organizing ourselves politically. And that carried through for so much of our history it was sort of part of the defining feature of, of why we worked. And then you get to today in which the defining feature of our politics is actually fragmentation and paralysis. And it's incredibly frustrating for us, I think, as citizens and even for some of the participants in politics who say, what are we doing here? I mean, what are we actually trying to accomplish here in Washington? And what I think Biden represents in some ways is by his sheer personal belief in the possibility of politics, that it's a business that is both worth doing, that it's dignified, that it can be productive, it can, it can help people's lives. That's, I think, something that people are sensing out there, even if they haven't quite put their, their name to it. Um, you know, somebody said to me in the course of reporting on Biden over the last year, they said, uh, you know, frankly, we're just ready to have a boring president again for a while. And I, there's, there's actually a powerful truth to that, by which he meant we're ready to have somebody who can help put politics back in its proper place as a, as a substructure in American life, but not the dominant focus of our conversation. That's not to say that we don't struggle for justice and we don't put that at the forefront. But the idea that the kind of political... Uh, pyrotechnics have to become the thing that we talk about every day at the dinner table. Frankly, people, I think, are exhausted of that. Hmm. Well, I think, you know, it's so interesting because as I listen to you, you're totally energized. You clearly have a positive spirit. You're not, you know, worn down. And, and that might have something to do with, I know what has always attracted me as a journalist about journalism is, well, you can just can go into a place with that spirit of you almost you alluded to it you know almost, almost being a tourist you know not not quite a mm -hmm. tourist but you know you came from china and you you know you somebody who had been away from the country for a long time was rediscovering it and there's something you know so energizing about that but it requires you to some degree keep that distance and not allow the pyrotechnics as you refer to it to just inundate you. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I um 
I, you were kind to mention this piece that I put in the New Yorker about Greenwich. That's actually a little preview of a book that's coming next year, which is that's sort of the closer cousin to what I did in China, which is the sort of, you know, the an attempt to try to make sense of this place over this long period of time. And it's I went I've been basically returning to three places I've lived, which is Greenwich, Connecticut, Chicago, Illinois, and Clarksburg, West Virginia, with exactly that mission in mind, which is to try to understand um, what's changed in the years I've been away, what what stays the same. And through those three windows, I hope to begin to explain to myself, frankly, um, what happened? How did it come to this? How did we end up in a moment of such fury in American life? And, um, you know, that term, the man from Mars, is a term that was given to us by John Gunther, who was, of course, you might remember the great American foreign correspondent who lived in Europe and came back uh, after World War II and, and tried to do exactly this, to understand how his own country had changed. And he wrote a book called Inside USA, in which he went around the country for a year and just took stock of the place, interviewed everybody he met, and... Um, and partly, you know, by being away, it had been made strange for him again. And for that reason, it kind of was revealed in, in slightly different ways than it would have been if he'd been here the whole time. And I, I took a lot of inspiration from what John Gunther did. And I, I think there's some, I hope, some value in that. I'm very conscious of the fact that we're living through a, a, a strange moment in this country when a, when a, a significant portion of our political leadership, particularly leaders of the Republican Party, are actively seeking to reduce the presence of American voters in places. I mean, there is an active voter suppression campaign going on. That's not a particularly partisan effort. It's not a partisan description. In fact, you've had some Republican officials describe it that way. And I think the reality is that we are, it's not hyperbole to say, we're in a struggle, not, not simply for one political leader or another, but to revitalize the, the structure and the integrity of American democracy. And uh, in, in really specific terms, Michael, one of the things I'll be looking for is to see what the role of violence is around this election. It's an ugly fact, but it's a, a fact that goes a long way back in American history. If you if you go back to the 1850s, there were pitched battles at polling places to try to prevent immigrants uh, from voting. And there's a history of this. Um, and what we've already seen in the run up to this election with uh, obviously there was a, a plot to kidnap and execute the governor of Michigan. Um, we've seen this kind of long run long range systematic assault on on the notion of American as a as a diverse multi ethnic democracy. And and there are there are it, there is a level of fierceness that has accumulated around this election that is really worrying. And I think all of us who are following this are sort of braced for the possibility that there could be violence. Um, there could be violence around 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 the election and um, I don't think personally that it's going to have a dispositive effect on what happens, um, but it is a, a measure of the health or ill health of American politics that we're all bracing for that. And again, you have, you know, some of your reporting has taken deep dives into the whole gun culture. Uh, is there anybody you're following up with any of the sources who you brought to life in some of your previous stories who you're checking in with now looking into this prospect? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to say that in some ways, you know, as a democracy, we are also distinguished by the fact that we're the only democracy in the world in which we have more guns than people. Um, that is a, a strange set of circumstances. Some of the people who I've been in touch with over the last few years are, uh, are, are talking about this election in, in somewhat apocalyptic terms. Um, and that worries me, you know, um, you know, to go to Richard Hofstetter again, who, you know, was a very prophetic figure in American life. As people remember, he was the great political scientist who, who taught us about anti-intellectualism, what he called the paranoid style. He talked about the power of conspiracy theory. 
great, you know, decades before it was happening in the, through the scale it is now. But, you know, Hofstadter writing in 1970, shortly before he died, said that it is one of the peculiar features of American politics that we have as many guns as we do. Um, and that, that changes the way that our politics works compared to some of our, our peer countries, other advanced democracies who don't have that. Um, so I am thinking very much about that around election day, which feature of our political tradition is going to prevail in the moment? Is it going to be this kind of fundamental commitment that we have to the power of, of rational discourse and the ability to talk things out uh, and arrive at some kind of roughly fashioned national consensus? Or is it going to be an uglier side of our tradition, but no less deep tradition um, of, of the power of, of force? And that is a worrisome contest, I'm afraid. There were so many anecdotes in your book that I really mm -hmm. want to share with people. And one of them, you talked about Joe Biden's first race for Senate against a very popular, avuncular kind of guy um, who sort of, I guess, went off track during the debate and could have easily, easily been tackled by Joe Biden. And Joe Biden restrained himself as a young man who was not favored to win that race, and he did. Tell us about that, and 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 I think it is germane to to today. Mm -hmm. Tell me, tell me about that anecdote and, and why it clearly struck you, and it struck me. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I'm 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 glad to hear that that stuck out to you. There that moment in this crucial period when Joe Biden was running in the 1972 Senate election. Um, he was running against a, a kind of longtime political stalwart, Kale Boggs, who'd held every major office in the state of Delaware. He was a World War II veteran. And, you know, here was Joe Biden, who was at that point uh, sort of ludicrously young, 29 years old, not even old enough to be able to take the seat in the Senate. And if he wanted, he would have to wait until swearing in to be old enough to be legally entitled to it. And they're on the debate stage. And there was a question that was asked um, it was a kind of intricate detail of foreign policy, and Kale Boggs didn't know the answer. And Biden knew the answer because, and there's a deeper, deeper truth in this, which we can talk about in a second. He knew the answer, and he he was given an opportunity by the moderator to to jump in and essentially kind of thrust the sword through his opponent if he wanted to. And he held back, and he didn't do it. And he said, uh, he he he's basically sort of. Uh, got his way out of the moment, said uh, that he, he, he didn't offer the answer. And later when he wrote about it, he said, look, the people there did not want to see Kale Boggs disgraced and embarrassed on that stage. It would have been like kicking the family dog. It just felt, it felt wrong. And there's something powerful in there, which is that he basically believes that politics is not blood sport. He says politics is essentially an act of humanity of people trying to fashion some way of being with one another. And it shouldn't be a scorched earth process in which only one prevails and one is and one is ruined. And I think you see that all the way up until today, all these years later, decades in politics, he has not given up on that, that belief. And I think it's a belief that many of us share and many of us certainly hope to continue in American politics which is that this should be the business of how we coexist, not the business of how we vanquish one another. Um, and I, I think that is very much a present piece of his persona. And for that, that I will say, Michael, to go to your very earliest point, that helps me sleep at night. I feel better about that. That is inspiring. You know, my kids who are older than yours and we have one son in college and, and an older a child at art school and now one in high school. And, that's something I, I really, really is essential for their future, mm -hmm. that aspect of, of political culture. So uh, thanks, thanks for framing it and articulating it so well. And, uh, and I do want to leave it with that. So uh, th thank you, Evan Osnos, for, uh, for joining us on At Home with Authors. My great pleasure, Michael. I always enjoy this conversation with you. Thanks. And be before you click off, I just, is there anything is there anything you want to point to over your right shoulder that could give us some insight into, into how you work, into how, you know, what kind of family life you have? Well, this gives you a window into, uh, 
this does give you a window into life in 2020. You're looking at a bowl that includes children's kids' masks. You've got uh, you you've got all of the you've got a the pot that we bake bread in, you know, we are fully inhabiting the 2020 pandemic life, I'm afraid. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I find in a curious way that, you know, being, this is a place where, um, you know, I, I, we rented this house about a year ago and I, I come out here to try to write now and then um, family, obviously we all come out here to try to get some time out of the city um, but it's a strange time in which the, the country feels to us, I think both sort of there's a stillness because we're all isolated more than we usually are. And yet at the same time, there's this cacophony, this kind of relentless noise. And that combination of the two things at once is such a strange way to be. I, I, I for one, am, you know, I find like you, I think, Michael, I find that one of the ways I make sense of this time is is in my books. It's in the reading, you know, and I go back and I I kind of try to find some meaning in what we've been through before. And often I find it and that's reassuring. And you, you use that term stillness in, in your um, acknowledgements page. If I can just call it up for one second, cause it's really uh, fascinating to me. Sorry, I told you it was the last question, but this is <laughs> an important image. You said um, uh, Biden has spent much of his life telling people you're either on the way up or you're on the way down. Mm. And it does feel like we are, suspended mm. at this moment in time yeah well put we're in a we're in a bit of a purgatory and i will add one important detail which is it can feel as if we're neither on the way up nor on the way down but the direction that we will head is our own doing it is not some preordained fact you know i i I've never quite been persuaded by the declinist narrative, but I am also not persuaded by the triumphalist narrative. And I am struck by the fact that American history is not actually a pendulum that just swings from one moment to the next. That implies something kind of natural. Actually, it is our doing, and it is very much sort of the product of our authorship as a, as a political culture. And that's very much on my mind. We are, this is ours to make. You know, Donald Trump, alas, was ours was a product of our own creation. And there is nothing preordained about what is to come. And I find that um, encouraging. I, this is the strangest, the strangest thing to say in 2020, but I actually am optimistic because when you go around and you see how people are talking about the future they want to make, that should give you, that should give you confidence. <laughs>